to Tome of Uselessness. I'm Devin. I'm Dan. And today we are talking about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. But first, did you like anything this week, Dan? Sure, I got a few things, as usual. Um, one thing that I was pretty hyped for, it just ended, was Invincible on Amazon Prime. It was super good. Oh, nice. Yeah, highly recommend based on the comic book, which I haven't read. And uh, yeah, it was animated show, good voice cast, good action. It's just basically it's like that. I assume this is because it's the world of the comic. It's like if there are superhuman people, when they punch somebody, there's effects. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, so it's like there's a lot of blood, a lot of gore, a lot of destruction because it's like that's what would happen kind of thing. And uh, it was good. I unintentionally basically figured out the story in the first episode, but it was still narratively satisfying. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Yeah, no, I highly recommend that. I also watched uh, season one of The Tick, which is also on Amazon Prime. Nice. Yeah, yeah it was... Those prime points. Yeah. But it's it, not it, even it, a thing. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> is that a new thing? No, it, it was good fun. Yeah, actually, it was, it was enjoyable and it just had some fun Tick stuff and... There's a little more focused on Arthur, which I have never read the Tick comics, so I'm not sure kind of how that dynamic works. But the Tick was there just being the Tick and just kind of obliviously going through this plot. <laughs> cool. I also, I guess I'll mention we were going to maybe do an episode about this, but that's still maybe up in the air or not. But I did finish American Gods season three, like last month, I think it was. Oh, yeah, I haven't started that yet. I'm sorry. Bad. No, that's a Bad uh, podcast host. <laughs> it's all right. It's also, it's kind of weirdly in flux because they've said that there's not going to be a season four. Oh, okay. But they've also said that they're like, well, maybe we could try to do like an event thing or maybe like almost like a movie or like a mini movie or mini series, but they're not sure. There's no official announcement. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know I should watch it, but I've just had such a hard time like committing to sitting down and watching it because... I hated the first two seasons so much. Yeah, and I really only kind of watched season three out of, like, almost a, not morbid curiosity, but a curiosity as well as I was like, okay, we, we might do an episode about this, so I'll watch it. And I had some issues, <laughs> which my notes indicate, <laughs> but it was also <laughs> weird because there was some good stuff in there, as per the season one and two. Yeah. But, uh, so anyway, that was just something I thought I'd bring that up. And then I finished uh, a book, um, The Dreaming Void, it's called. And that's by Peter F. Hamilton. And it's the second trilogy of uh, the Commonwealth saga, I guess, that he wrote kind of thing. And it's good. It's the first one in the trilogy. But what's funny is because I've read this and his past stuff, as well as his more recent writings, that I almost think I understand or know where the story's going to go. <laughs> oh, nice. And But I'm also like, OK, maybe I could be wrong about it, of course. But I was also like, I could definitely see it going that way because that's some of the ideas he's written about and used in other things. <laughs> <laughs> That's his style. <laughs> yeah, basically. But so anyway, it was enjoyable. Uh, plan on reading the next one, of course. And yeah, I think that's all I got. Nice. Um, okay, so I rewatched Bad Times at the El Royale. Nice. Which is still a great movie, and I really like it, and I don't know why it doesn't get more hype. Yeah, I know we've talked about this before as well, that it's it's a great movie. It's like a great movie. Um, and then because I watched Bad Times at the El Royale, it made me want to rewatch Knives Out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Which I also did, and I still enjoyed. Drag Race Season 13 just ended the same day that Falcon and the Winter Soldier ended, actually. It was really good. Good season, good group. They're kind of getting, like, the first three episodes are kind of annoying because they're trying to like spice things up a bit so they don't eliminate people the first two episodes and they split them up into two groups and it kind of creates some like fake drama and stuff sure but once you get past the first three episodes it's pretty good after that nice i really like i've talked about this before i really like the podcast why our dad's and they did an episode on Pretty Woman, so I watched Pretty Woman, which I hadn't seen in, like, probably, like, 20 years, I want to say. Sure, it's not something that... Maybe four. Yeah, I haven't seen it in forever, either. 
Yeah, and it was interesting because I thought the movie started like like 45 minutes into the actual movie. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot the first 45 minutes of the movie. Um, And then it's also, I kind of texted you about this while I was watching it, but it's also really weird, like jarring watching movies that take place in a particular city and that city is kind of important to the plot that were filmed before like digital touch-ups on backgrounds existed Mm -hmm. (laughs) because when you watch it and they're in LA it's not like blue skies and like and like making the city look really like alive and vibrant and like LA it's smog <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's real LA <laughs> it's real LA. it's like smog and gray buildings and it looks cold like <laughs> when they do establishing shots it looks like cold and gross nice <laughs> yeah so it was like kind of jarring to like because like I, I don't know like a lot of people don't realize that like when you're looking at like a movie with New York in the background you're not looking at like footage of new york you're looking at footage of new york that had like many many layers of special effects applied to it so that it looks the way new york feels if that makes sense i feel like yeah it uh it is strange watching older movies because they they don't do that and so the places look realistic but they also look like wrong (laughs) Mm. yeah sure and of course like even in uh, other oh, yeah productions of course they could try to shoot certain things or certain days or certain times to get certain lighting but of course now they can literally just make it happen <laughs> yeah it doesn't even have to be like nighttime to make it look like nighttime or daytime to make it look like daytime yeah but what's it called has a had a big influence on that um oh brother where art thou yeah, I think, like, we talked about, that's credited as the first one to be, like, dead, where they color-coded the whole movie, like, digitally. Yeah, now it's kind of, like, standard practice for... For movie. good or ill, depending on the movie. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> some movies can make it work, and others mo- make it look like, why is this whole movie gray and grayer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why, is these, why do they only have three colors that they use? Yeah. Why is everything purple? Why is this synth way? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know it's cliche, but I, well, especially now, but um, I really liked the color correction in traffic because it was like everything that took place on the, Mex- uh, the Mexico side was all like yellow tinted. And then everything that was in America was all blue tinted. And it just kind of really helped you like visually to be like where the story is taking place. So that was like, well done. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I haven't seen traffic. It's a good movie. I really like it. I had to read a book, and this is it's just a sidetrack right now. Sure. In, in grade seven, when I was in French immersion, I had to read a book called Traffic, which is like traffic, it's the same. Yeah. But I um, was too young and naive to realize that traffic could mean like trafficking drugs or trafficking humans or whatever. Mm-hmm. I just thought it applied to cars. <laughs> I was very confused for the entire book. I'm like, there's no cars in this book at all. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> when does the traffic happen? <laughs> yeah. They're clearly going the wrong direction in this story. Yeah. They keep talking about drugs. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> I want to know about rush hour. <laughs> yeah. You're like, <laughs> you're like Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible 3 or 4. I think it's 4. Tell me about those traffic patterns. <laughs> no, that's 3. <laughs> sorry, sorry to sidetrack the conversation. <laughs> no, that's all right. That, that's all good. It was important that you knew that, though. Well, and just like you were saying, talking about a, an older film, like a, uh, just before we start recording, I watched Cloud Atlas, which I'd never seen before from 2012. And that definitely had some interesting stuff going on. And also that you're just like the technology they used back then, of course, has advanced that you're like some of this stuff could have been, you know, could be so much easier to be done compared to because i'm sure they spent i think it was pretty expensive at the time to, you know on all the effects and stuff like that where it's just like i'm sure that the cost for some of those would be like half now <laughs> oh yeah totally <laughs> half cost and half the time 
Yeah, like it would render so much faster. <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> Unless you have anything else, we're talking Falcon and Winter Soldier. That was the other thing I finished watching. Nice. I am ready to talk about it. I uh, didn't. I, I watched the show once. I didn't rewatch it. But I did watch Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame recently. Nice. So they are in those movies. <laughs> they are indeed in those movies. And of course, this takes place after <laughs> Infinity War and Endgame. Yeah. Hey, can I ask you a question right off the bat? Sure. Is Steve Rogers dead or just off the grid? Well, then that's there's theories about all that and stuff like that. I I mean, six months later, he could be dead, but I don't think he is dead. Okay. Because there was that one guy who has that line in episode six where he's just like, I thought Captain America was on the moon. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm curious, like, like, I know logistically, like, it would be expensive to have Chris. Evans. Evans, Chris Evans, like in makeup, so that there was a scene with him. Yeah. But um, I was also, I, it just seemed like it wasn't really spelled out in the movie, so I wasn't sure if, yeah, if he was dead or not. I think that's something that they're kind of keeping. They can just keep that in their back pocket. That if they want to bring him for a cameo, they can. They can, right? yeah. yeah. By not saying, well, and that's something that's interesting in that. Captain America in several of the comics and maybe some of the cartoon storylines that I'm more familiar with, his super soldier uh, serum and procedure makes him immortal. Oh. So, like, he also doesn't age in many of the comics. <laughs> well, they retconned that in Endgame. Sure. So, yeah, that was to say that was one of the things that the MCU has taken and made differently is that he does age and so does Isaiah Bradley as well. So it's just like that... That is a difference that I was just kind of like, because that's one thing that's interesting and in, as uh, it's been used to some effect in some storylines where he lives so much longer and, you know, America and other countries become so different that he's like, I can't even be a hero anymore because it's all messed up. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's one thing that's like definitely different, like you said. Uh, so answer, I don't know where Captain America is or Steve Rogers is, but I assume that he's just like staying, staying low, staying off grid. <laughs> okay. I just, it feel like it, um, make it, like, you could interpret Bucky's actions differently, depending whether, if he, if he, if Steve Rogers was dead, mm. or if Steve Rogers was in hiding. I don't know. No, you're yeah. absolutely right. Because, like he says to him, he's just like, you know, the shield is like the closest thing I'd have to a family kind of thing. And it's like, if Steve was still around, he could go visit Steve. Totally, right? Yeah. But they only so, just say, they just say Steve is gone. Yeah. So maybe he went up with uh, Fury. He's up in space. Oh, he's on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> Him, Fury, Luther, they're all hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, wrong comic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I did course finish it on the when the show was released and i just did a rewatch as well and then i watched their little behind the scenes like assembling thing um, oh cool yeah i was hoping it would have some more details but it, you know it's kind of it's because it's it's a little more about like hyping it up and etc so there's they show some stuff and they did show some behind the scenes uh which i found interesting as well yeah that would be cool i i mean i guess it could be just like a tv spot to promote it too right yeah it's like an hour long and it's just kind of like interviews with the director the writer uh the main cast and some of the people when they when they talk about their character and stuff like that and here's one thing i'll say which you may or may not agree with uh, as well is that actors of course they always enjoy a little more of those roles that have like the darker thing because there's like a little more to meet, to go in with it and like anthony mackie in this really good as falcon i really like his performance Oh, but my God, gets, yeah. yeah. Anthony he, Mackie stole the show for me. Of course. And he gets to be a little more bar, bar, more bombastic and a little more out there. But Sebastian Stan, after watching this and then I rewatched uh, Winter Soldier, makes me, like, really appreciate his Winter Soldier performance a lot. Like, way more, even though he's in that movie, you know, briefly. But I was just like, he is, like, killing it in that movie and killing it in this show. 
on a level I wasn't really appreciating more until I've seen more of him, if that makes sense. Yep, totally, totally. I thought they were, yeah, they were both great in it. I just thought that Anthony Mackie was like, like okay, here's, here's how I'm going to describe it. Mm-hmm. Sebastian Stan is like the moon and Anthony Mackie's like the sun. They're mm-hmm. both important and they both have specific jobs, but Mackie shines brighter. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, you know, I really liked Anthony Mackie's performance as well. But I just, like I said, I just appreciate a little more what Sebastian Stan was doing in his performances as Bucky. Because of, like, yeah, we've seen it more and more. And I was just kind of like, like I said, rewatching The Winter Soldier, I was kind of like, there's a lot more going on than just guy with gun and looking menacing or whatever, right? (laughs) And now I want to go watch Winter Soldier. Hold on for two and a half hours. Yeah, right pause. <laughs> but I guess just real briefly, uh, Winter Soldier, there was six episodes it's on Disney Plus, if you don't know that by now. Uh, it was created by Malcolm Spellman. He was also the head writer. There was also, he had some other writers with him. Uh, the, the director was one Kerry Scogland. I probably pronounced that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, just because I actually really did like the cinematography throughout the entire show, the cinematographer was PJ Dillon. And I thought there was like, obviously our abilities and production values and camera work and everything can be so much better now than things were in the past. But I just thought there was a lot of good shots and a lot of good setups and a lot of good camera motion and movement that I just really appreciated in the show. I will agree with that on, with one caveat, Mm -hmm. anytime there was a flying fight scene. I couldn't follow it at all. That's interesting because I felt that the flying fight scene in episode one and episode six were really good. Oh, I, I completely disagree. Mm. Um, especially in episode six, we had to like rewatch it a bunch to figure out that there were two different helicopters. Right. Like we just like, I, I was watching it with uh, Peter and Tony and, like, none of us could follow what was going on visually. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It just, I don't know. It was too, it was dark. It was, like, too shaky. It was too, I don't know. It just didn't work for me. But the rest of the cinematography, I will agree with. But specifically, <laughs> the flight fight scene in episode one and episode six really I didn't I didn't jive with it at all well and that I was gonna say that's interesting because uh for me the episode two truck fight sequence I didn't like (laughs) the truck fight yeah the when they're on top of the trucks and then oh I thought that was great (laughs) no like I liked the the concept and I liked the fighting and I liked some of the stuff out of it but then there was also a too much like shaky cam close cam cut in for me oh yeah See, that that, didn't... i don't know it just made the, sh- the fight feel like less flowy to me uh which i was it was uh, which was unfortunate because i was digging the stuff you know they got the shield it's bouncing off they're doing some sweet punches falcon flying bucky flying around and but every so often they'd cut to this like close shaky cam and i was like ah oh, this is just jarring i didn't mind that at all yeah, fair enough <laughs> <laughs> so we'll disagree now we have to fight to the death no oh, no for opinion supremacy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and it happens. <laughs> I like I like how go, we have to fight to the death and you're like, yeah, okay. I mean <laughs> yeah, it's 2021 and everything's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also one thing I was interested, this is unverified, but I think I found this on Wikipedia, is that their budget was approximately $150 million. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I was like, that's why it looks so good. <laughs> yeah, totally. And also it probably didn't help that because uh, I was watching that behind the scenes thing. They, of course, famously were filming. They were filming in Prague. And then when the pandemic became more of a factor, they had to leave. And then there was like a long break. And then they had to go back, of course, to film again. So it's like, I'm sure that increased all the budgets. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. I don't know, I was just saying, unless you, we could talk about some of the cast, or what do you want to do here next? Um, I guess we should talk about the story. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, story. What do you got? 
Don't worry. Okay. So we open. It's like a couple weeks after Endgame. Uh, it's actually six months after Endgame. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> six months after Endgame, Mr. Falcon has decided to give the Captain America shield to the Smithsonian because he doesn't feel he has mixed emotions about being Captain America. As anyone would. Yeah, totally. Bucky's in therapy, and he is friends with an old man, and he killed the old man's son when he was Winter Soldier. And he doesn't have any friends aside from that. <laughs> yeah, he's association slightly with Bucky, but not really anything there. <laughs> yeah. Or, not um, with Bucky, was with... <laughs> with. With Anthony Mackie, sorry. With Sam. <laughs> With Sam, yeah. Sam tries to get a loan to help his sister out, and he's denied it, but the guy's like a total dick and is like, can I take your picture with you because you're the falcon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, how would you give me a loan, asshole? And he's like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also find out that there is a terrorist group that... Uh, basically, there were people who benefited from the blip. So they were able to, like, move into abandoned houses and get more resources and food and stuff. And the five years later, when everybody came back, they got pushed out of their homes, pushed out of their jobs, lost the resources that they had. And so they want to do crime to make the world a better place. Yeah, and well, it's not only that, it's like depicted as well as like that they were living in places that wouldn't have welcomed them previously to the fact, you know, that half the planet was gone, right? So they Right, because they had opened up some borders to help stuff. Yeah, that is, it's, it was depicted essentially, yeah, like after the snap that the world came together and people were living wherever they could and, you know, were welcomed rather than pushed away. Yeah, totally. And so they're trying to, they want to bring people back to that um, also, a new Captain America has been named, John Walker, who, did you know he's Kurt Russell's son in real life? Yeah, Wyatt Russell, yeah. Yeah, Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn's son? Yeah. Yeah. And he was a hockey player? Yeah, I know he's also done, he, I think he was in, like, some kind of football show, like Friday Night Lights or something along those lines, I don't know. He was really good in this. He was, yes. <laughs> He was so good, and there's sometimes when you, like, get close up of his face where you're like, oh, yeah, he is totally Kurt Russell's son. <laughs> <laughs> also, did you know he was getting, like, a ton of death threats? I read something briefly a bit of, but on that online, but I was also kind of like, I don't know. It's that just, like, that could be Twitter stuff, and you just turn that off. <laughs> yeah, good point. Turn off Twitter. That's what everyone should do every day, regardless of what's going on in the world. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I mean... It, it seems like these days, and not to get all political, but like fandoms seem to take everything too far, and there's death threats for everything now. That is true. I think it doesn't help that um, the world is bored because yeah. we're stuck inside, like we can't do anything. So it like it helps to like vent your frustration on somebody, but it also makes no sense to vent your frustration at an actor. Because he's pretend Captain America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's not real Captain America. Then there'd be an issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's the setup for the show. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. But what did I miss? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure there's some minor details. But I also really liked, you know, again, just the, ind the individual scene where Bucky remembers the assassination of the Winter Soldier. That was great. Yeah, can I tell you the honest to God truth that I feel about this show? Okay. I That's why we're here. We're giving our opinion. What? <laughs> yeah, I know. I felt like the first episode and the last episode were the weakest episodes. I half agree. Especially the first episode. Yeah, like, I feel at the end of the day, the show didn't fully stick the landing, but I still felt, like, on the second rewatch that I was like, okay, it really, it, you know, really kind of stuck it pretty good. Uh, I felt that the first episode was a little weak, 
in some parts, but then I also was intrigued by the story elements that they were kind of setting up. I'm like, okay, you know, what's what's going on here? The first episode made me question if I wanted to watch the rest of it. Right, but episode two, I felt really took it Episode off. two and episode three are so great. I'm so glad that I continued to watch it. <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> yeah, two and three are, like, really cool. But, yeah, they just I wanted to to point that out that I thought that the, the like if if I ranked it from like worst to best it would go one six five mm. four two three mm-hmm. personally I just I did I felt like it was like not a very like even though a lot of stuff happened and we explained that stuff it was um it wasn't super engaging for me yeah and I, I think that part of the problem was that it opened with the flying fight scene that I couldn't follow. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I kind of found the first episode a bit boring. That's yeah. fair. And, it, and also the way it was kind of setting up the elements, they all felt very disconnected, of course. Yeah, and it totally. Was just, and it, so you're just, and especially like you said, that uh, opening action sequence, it's very in media res, where it's just like, okay, it's Falcon doing some stuff for the government. But it's not connected to anything loose. It kind of loosely is with Batroc, but but not really. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, okay, that's his job, I guess, <laughs> right? But it's. But I felt uh, for sure. I I did like in episode one when Torres, his buddy, is investigating the Flag Smasher like robbery, and they do a a good reversal where you know he's fighting the big guy, and then he's talking with Sam, and he's like, oh, this guy's the new leader, blah blah blah. But of course. In episode two, we find out not him. <laughs> not him. <laughs> yeah. So I, li- I like that. That was a good, you know, reversal. I also, um, we'll, we'll get into this later, but I kind of enjoyed that uh, the, the characters, with the exception maybe of Sam, the characters are all very close to this, like, morally gray line. <laughs> sure. Like, the bad guys, the good guys. And their their moralities and how it plays off each other is very interesting as well. Whereas like Sam, I think is is pretty like lawful good. Well, yeah, he's he's you're setting him up at, throughout the show as well as to be to take on the mantle of Captain America. And Steve Rogers, of course, was the the good of the good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, so episode two, Sam and Bucky are on assignment together to European country to try to, because they get, what are they? They find out that there might be some super soldier serum out there. Is that what it is? Well, so after Torres fights the first person, then he's like, okay, that guy's way too strong. So they're like, they only think there's one. They're like, you know, there might be a super soldier out there, <laughs> right? Right. And the European country, it's it's supposed to be Germany that they go to. Oh, okay. I couldn't remember. <laughs> but basically, he's they're just like, we 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 think they're here. Let's go investigate. Yeah, um, and they go to um, a warehouse, which they then see them load a truck, and they follow the truck. No, doesn't Sam? Sam goes hides in the truck because he thinks there's like um, a refugee in there or something. He sees like a, he infrared scans it. And he's like, oh, someone's in the truck. That's probably a hostage. And so Bucky runs off and. This was a cool little thing as well, again, that they're, like, depicted as they might be loading or stealing weapons of some sort. And then when they open up the truck, they're like, dude, it's medicine and, like, food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And then that's when we get our reveal of Carly. Carly is the leader, and she's, like, a 10-year-old girl. <laughs> How old is she? 18 or something? She's a teenager of some sorts, at undefined age, I think. <laughs> And she is also a super soldier because there's this gets revealed later, but the, there's a new serum that doesn't make you super buff, but makes you super strong. Yeah. So anybody could be a super soldier now. And um, a couple of them have taken the serum. They do a f- fight on the truck and Captain America shows up. The new Captain America, John Walker, and kind of fucks things up a bit well it's, it's it's debatable he does help and they do fight it out but it doesn't go well for our group of heroes yes and he is very 
he's really trying to get Bucky and Sam to join his super team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they are very not much. They're just not having it at all. Basically. I'm sure other things happen, but it ends with them, with Bucky and Sam deciding to break Zemo out of prison, right? Basically, they're like decide to go to CZ. So they basically, uh, after that fight, they go to Baltimore, where Isaiah Bradley is introduced into oh, the boy, show. Oh, I for- totally forgot about him. My yeah. bad. No, it's all good. So yeah, he gets introduced in episode two, and uh, they learn that there was a previous super soldier after, or a subsequent one after Steve, but it was buried, and he was never... Because he, he was black. Yes, and he was imprisoned and experimented on for 30 years. Because white people are terrible. I say that <laughs> as a white person. It's okay for me to say it. <laughs> we have a terrible history of being assholes. <laughs> yep, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, for, I, I forgot about... You know what? I watched two and three at the same time, like back to back, and I think I'm just mixing up the sequence of... Events. No, that's fine. And in that sequence as well... Uh, Bucky gets arrested because he missed his therapy appointment because he went to help Sam. And oh, and then they have joint ther- therapy. They have joint therapy, yes. <laughs> I liked that scene. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, it was a great scene. And it's just, the, you know, the characters having fun with each other. <laughs> yeah, and kind of being, like, belligerent to each other, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, th- and this one was, what was interesting, and it kind of started to reveal things, is that, like, because Cap, John Walker gets Bucky out of the therapy and out of prison. And so it's like he's using the authority. Basically, he's like using authority to break rules. Yes. All right. He's not working within the systems. He's always breaking the systems because he thinks he has that authority. Well, he's kind of he's given that, but it's also like he's abusing his cap powers, essentially. Totally. And he, um, yeah, he's very... He's like an ends justifies the means almost kind of guy. Yeah, I was going to say he's kind of pragmatic that way, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, in a weird way, like, it's kind of, it would be like a similar Captain America to if, like, Stephen Strange became Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Not but in, it's... like, the, the macho way, but in, like, the way he's like, well, I need to get this done. We're going to get this done by any means possible. <laughs> yeah, well, I, or I was going to say that it's also reflected in Carly, because they're just trying to do anything, do what they can via any means possible. Yeah, I feel like Carly is on more of a, like, slope. She kind of, like, the more she gets into it, the more she allows. Sure. Whereas, like, John Walker is at 100 right away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I'm Captain America! (laughs) Yeah. And then, yeah, then after that, leading into three, when they're like, we, we, let's go see Zemo. Yeah, who's on the island, right? The island of bad people. No, he's like in a regular jail of some sort. Oh, he's not in the floating prison? No, he's not in the raft. He's in some sort of like, you know, probably supermax type prison, but it's not the raft. Not until the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good so thing that's... that I mix things up very easily. <laughs> No, but I mean, that's a, that's a safe assumption, but it's also like, then they wouldn't have been able to bust him out from the raft versus. Right. You know, well, he, he busts himself out. They just well. happen to be there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you want to be technical. Okay. Yes, exactly. Episode but, three. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I loved uh, Daniel Brule coming back as emo and he, he nailed it again as well. Like oh. he was, it was awesome. <laughs> He was so good in it. He's everybody's favorite now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Baron Zemo. Okay, so the three of them go to seedy underworld, underground, random European city that doesn't exist in real life. I think it's more like in like a Southeast Asia style place because it's called Madripoor. And uh, from the production design and everything, they're kind of like mixed you know, Vietnamese and, like, um, uh, what was the other place? Uh, another Southeast Asian-style look into this place. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it's very vaporwave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that as well. Very important to note that. It feels like it could fit into the Akira universe. Oh, definitely. So they pretend... So 
Zemo pretends that that Bucky is still the Winter Soldier and under his control, mm-hmm. and he dresses Sam up like an important person. Yeah, another criminal underworld guy. Yeah, who happens to look similar to Sam. I really, I liked, I liked the scene in the bar where they're all hamming it up. It was pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, super good. <laughs> so we learned that the power broker controls this city, and also had a batch of the super serum soldiers. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. For when they meet with Selby, and she's like, okay, you know, there's some super soldiers going around, going on, but they don't really get too much info. Yeah. Because Sam gets that call, which is like, why would you have your phone on, bro? You're spy. You're in spy mode. <laughs> oh, I know. There's so much tension. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they get they get found out. They have to fight their way out of the club. What's her name? Peggy's niece. Sharon Carter. Sharon Carter happens to be in the city uh, because she's working there as an art dealer of illegal arts, and. <laughs> She takes them back to their her place, lets them go to her party of art, 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 and then takes them to the shipping yard the next day to find the dude that's making the super serum serum soldier stuff. Yeah, and here was something that I thought was hilarious, of course, that it's like, okay, Sharon Carter introduced, I was like, oh, very cool, you know, and she's like, oh, I didn't have a lot of help, so I'm here chilling, blah, 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 and then she's like, I got a place in Hightown. But as soon as they got to that place in Hightown, I was like, okay, there's no way she is not the power broker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I was like, oh my God, she's the power broker. And Tony and Pete's like, is she? I don't know. And I'm like, no, no, she is. Yeah, <laughs> if she was like, oh, I got a place in Hightown and they went and it was just like a nice apartment. And she's like, yeah, this is kind of where I live. Uh, but, you know, I'm, j- I'm still, she's like a mercenary, etc. But she's like, yeah, got like all the fancy paintings. And she's like, I'm having a party. And it's like, okay, there's no way you're not the power broker. <laughs> Which I was listening to the interview with the the, uh, the writer and he was talking about it. And he's like, uh, sometimes we felt like it was too, like we were doing too much to show it. Sometimes it was not enough. And I was like, it was more than enough to, for us to know because it's, yeah. it's, it's episode six. It's supposed to be a big like reveal that it's like, she's a power broker. And you're like, yeah, it was obvious. <laughs> we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of makes it weird because then it's like, she's helping them find her own scientist. And I'm like, I guess was she just trying to do it? Cause she wanted the pardon. Sure. But it's also, it's like, so she could just get them off the Island. Cause they're like, they're just going to cause problems if they're here. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it was a little bit like these guys need to leave as soon as possible so that they don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, basically they're like they're like they're just gonna smash things until they find the answer anyway. I'll just get them <laughs> off the island. <laughs> so they go to find this the scientist, and Zemo kills him. Yeah. Does he did destroy some of the serum too? No, um, that's later. But it's also basically because Zemo the whole time he's like there should be no super soldiers. He's like, you know, it's bad. And so, yeah, he just yeah. straight up shoots this, the scientist and then they get attacked and that destroys his lab. And he right, does right. reveal that 20 vials of super soldier serum were stolen. That's what it was. That's right. Yeah. And then they have that awesome fight scene in the shipping container yard where Sharon Carter's just like fucking taking ass and giving names. <laughs> yeah, Thank she's... You. It's a classic, a good location for a fight, you know? <laughs> yeah, she's just like, oh, what? You wanted to live? I'm sorry. <laughs> no. And then we also get Zemo putting on the mask. Yeah, because he's the Baron, right? He is indeed the Baron. Is that the end of episode three? Well, the, the, the Flag Smashers also raid a GRC facility and then bomb it. Right, right, right. And doesn't Captain America have, like, a conversation with Battlestar, his sidekick? That's later. That's the next one. Like, the main conversation about, like, would you do it kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's in the next one. Okay. And this is also where, so they go to Latvia, and uh, Barnes runs into Ao, uh, the member of the the Dora Milaje from Wakanda. From Wakanda. I know this is in the next episode, but the the scene with them and Captain America was so good. It was really good. 
<laughs> it was so good. It, it like like a lot of the time, you know, people talk about like show don't tell. Mm-hmm. And this was such a good example of showing his character mm-hmm. in like less than a minute. <laughs> Anyways, okay, let's move on. Episode four. What happens? <laughs> the world is watching in this one. Oh, so, oh, that's oh yeah, this one has the craziest ending. It does have an ending. <laughs> so yeah, so Barnes negotiates with Ao, and she's he's like, we need him, we need Zemo. She's like, I'll give you eight hours before we take him. So do your thing. Yeah. So they hurry her to find. Carly, because they found out her, like, not relation, but someone who took care of her is dead, so they want to go to her funeral to talk to her. Yeah, just to talk. And then stupid Captain America crashes the party with Battlestar, right? Is Mm -hmm. that his name? It is, yes. Okay. I keep thinking that it's not Battlestar, because I'm like, oh, I'm just thinking of Battlestar Galactica. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, even I had to double check it a couple times and I was like, it's Battlestar, right? I'm like, okay, yes, it is. <laughs> so they show up and uh, Sam wants to go talk to her one-on-one. Yeah, before this, though, we do get some good stuff where they go to a camp and then they kind of see how these people are living and Sam and Bucky, you know, try to talk to people to figure, you know, to find her. But also they learn, especially Sam, about these people that are living and trying to just... He, you know, he talks to that teacher and he's like, we were told we were going to get supplies like six months ago. Like, he's like, we're just existing, essentially. And how the GRC is not helping these people, even though it pledged to and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, some good world building before the funeral. That's true. And Zemo gives some kids some Turkish delight. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, like if you're giving Turkish delight to children, you might as well just like put a big fucking villain sign above your head <laughs> you know the, the snow queen in, in narnia ruined it for everyone she did what a bitch yeah. <laughs> but yeah so like you said they find out where the funeral is and as when they go there cap shows up and he wants to go in all like let's take her down <laughs> and sam's like no let me go talk to her she's just a kid stop being a fucking tool He's like, you have 10 minutes. And then I really liked the scene between Sam and Carly. It was great. It was really great. It showed, like, like, it showed Sam's expertise at talking to soldiers with PTSD Mm -hmm. and applying it to the situation. When Captain America storms in, like, you can see the betrayal on Carly's face. Yeah, and this is something we've talked about previously in the past where... Uh, something that these writers are successful at doing is that you understand your quote unquote villain's point of view. Like she wasn't written as a villain. She was written as a hero of her story. And it's like, but it's just her methodology clashes and with the world at large. Right. So totally it's really good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and yeah, like you said, when, uh, cause Bucky tries to stop it. He's like, you know, Hey cap, you said you'd give him 10 minutes. Like, it hasn't even been 10 minutes. And this is one thing I liked. Uh, this was on a second rewatch that I caught this, that he's like, your partner's in there with, like, a dangerous person, needs backup. Do you want his blood on your hands? Mm. And I was like, oh, that's going to be bad in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's, like you said, Captain's America's, John Walker's actions lead to deaths and lead to bad stuff right and so anyway i just really liked that that i was like like you said he's coming in all hot-headed when carly was listening to sam they were talking this out yeah and like yeah just the the betrayal on her face and like i don't know i thought it was just really well done Mm -hmm. and this is in the process of this fight zemo manages to catch up and get around and get to carly first and find the ser- uh, serum, and smash the vials. Almost all of the vials. Mm-hmm. That was Almost. a great reveal. Yeah. <laughs> Captain America ends up stealing one of the vials. He does, yes. Yes. What happens next? This is where they go to the uh, apartment, and the Dora and Milaje are there, and Captain America is there. 
Yeah, so they go there, and the, what are they called, Dole Malaje River? Well, before the Dora and Malaje show up, uh, just Captain and Battlestar are there, and they're talking with them, and Sam and Bucky especially are like, dude, you, you're going about this wrong, and John Walker, again, he's just like lording his power over them, and he's just like, what, you want to fight me? <laughs> and it's just like, they're not saying that, you're the one bringing that up, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Like you said, the Dore Milaje show up, and he tries to brush them off, essentially. Yeah, and then they fight him, and then they win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, they take off Bucky's arm. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of surprising. I was like, not expecting that. It makes sense, though, because they made his arm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved it, because it was like... <laughs> Out of nowhere, almost, right? You're like, what is she doing? And then his arm falls off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it looks like she hits him, like, a couple times with, like, a pressure point type strike that would, like, you know, incapacitate somebody or something like that. But then his arm just, like, ka <laughs> falls to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. So good. And, of course, that ends. Uh, Zemo escapes yeah. through, like, a drain. Also ends with uh, John Walker. He, after they lose, he's just like, they weren't even super soldiers. <laughs> yeah, he's so dejected. Yeah, and you can see, yeah, like how much he's fraying. Because I think there was something in, sorry, you were corrected. I think it was in episode three where they're like raiding places looking for Carly and not getting the respect because he, he's Captain America. And like people are like, I don't give a shit that you're Captain America, right? And so he's like starting to fray at the seams a little. <laughs> oh, totally. And he's just like, it's like he... He wanted to be Steve without doing the work to be Steve. Well, I mean, he's just, it, this goes back to something that was even in the first Avenger, the dichotomy between the good man and the good soldier. Mm. Right? Because Steve was always betrayed. He was a good man, at, like, in the core. And John Walker, as we've seen even in episode two, when they were showing him, it's like, he's a great soldier. He was trained. He was fought in Afghanistan and other wars. He's got medals and et cetera. But does he have that temperament? We find out as the show goes, no. no. <laughs> right? <laughs> but he was selected because he was a great soldier. Yeah. Right. So it's just like it still brings up that theme and dichotomy, which was great. Totally. Okay, so. And then this is where they have their conversation, like you were saying. Yeah, then they have a conversation between Battlestar and Captain America where he's like, if you could take the, the, the serum, would you? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they basically talk about some of their previous tours. And they're like, if we had people with a serum, we could have saved more lives or, you know, et cetera. But it also reflects, because I think just before, maybe it's in that episode earlier, but B Zemo is talking with Sam and he's like, would you take the serum? And Sam's like, no, <laughs> just like immediately. Right. Is that, yeah, the conversation between Sam and and Zemo, is that when they're talking about, like, anybody who takes it is a supremacist? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and then, yeah. And then a Battlestar is kind of like, doesn't he say something kind of to the effect of, like, whatever type of person you are, it'll just enhance that type of person? Yeah, that's always the theory with, like, any kind of power, is that it'll reveal you you more. Yeah, and then he talks up John some more, and I think at that, that's kind of like, John's like, oh, okay, I can take the serum. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, my friend's right. I, you know, make the right decisions consistently. This will help us stop these people taking the serum. <laughs> so do you think, he takes it kind of after that, right? I don't remember, they don't yes. show it on screen, right? No, it's definitely after that, because like in the next sequence, which is the fight, he's suddenly stronger and et right. cetera. Yeah, that's right. No, I was just going to talk about what happens next. Well, basically, yeah, Carly calls Sam's sister, and she's like, hey, I want to talk to him again. And they set up a meeting, and then it leads to the last final action scene. Yes, yes, yes. So they're in, like, a house or warehouse or something? Yeah, it's like an abandoned house that looks like it leads, and they go, well, that's where Carly and them are, but then they capture Captain America and Battlestar in, like, a like a garment, like sewing house almost looks like, or something like that, like a factory. And then uh, they fight a lot. And then Battlestar gets kicked to death. Yeah, Carly just straight, like, one punches him into a pillar. 
Yeah, she like push kicks him into a pillar and it snaps his neck. Yeah. And, or his back or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And Captain America goes nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he just chases down the closest dude and smashes him to death with his shield. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is such an intense scene to end a show on, <laughs> like yeah. an episode on. Yeah, and it, and it's out like near a fountain, so there are people everywhere with phones everywhere, of course, and recording it. <laughs> recording it, and then Becky and Sam are just like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting because it brings up uh, an interesting morality point, of course, with superhero stuff, uh, that it's like, when they were fighting, who was trying to kill the other person and who wasn't? And then this is like, then he's just like, because you got to assume people are dying, of course. Uh, Sam's blowing up helicopters earlier in the show. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, but this is like a guy that he's extraditionally executing on the street, (laughs) right? Yeah, and not in a... Not, like, shooting a gun, but, like, smashing him to death with the Captain America shield. (laughs) Sure. And, yeah, and it's like he had the guy defeated. He was down. He could have, like, just arrested him, essentially, at that point or whatever, right? And he chose violence. Yeah. It's interesting, too, like, symbolically, he is beating to death a person with the symbol of Captain America. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Right? He's not, like, punching him in his face. He's using the shield, like, every, like, the thing that represents Captain America and his goodness, and his, he's using that as a weapon. <laughs> sure. And and to the people on the street, of course, it's like, this person's just a refugee, or maybe not a refugee, but, like, you know, a displaced person and stuff like that. And then he's just like, here's the power of... America just mashing them into the street. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it's like, uh, not not a good look. <laughs> not a great look, guys. Not a great look. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah, like you said, that's how the episode ends. And of course, with the week to week format, I was like, wow, like you said, that like what a great ending. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was thinking about it all week. Yeah. <laughs> and that leads us into episode five. This episode, unless I'm mistaken, starts with. Bucky and Sam tracking down John Walker kind of immediately after it happens, correct? Yeah, it had some of my favorite cinematography in the beginning when John's walk running away and then he's like running in an almost an abandoned warehouse. And then he's in that warehouse. There was a couple of really good shots, like the shot where he's kneeling down with the shield in front of him and like with the light cast on him and stuff like that. It was a great yeah, shot. Yeah, it was really well done. So they, they fight him. He just, uh, John destroys Sam's wings. Mm -hmm. Bucky gets pretty beat up, but they end up uh, leaving with the shield. Yeah, and it's also, again, showing a little bit how far John, because he was choking Sam. It's like, (laughs) were you? Yeah, he was ready to just choke Sam out. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like, you're going to choke this guy to death? He's supposed to be on your side. You wanted him on your team. Like, what are you doing, man? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I don't remember if this is how it happens chronologically, but John Walker is asked to step down as Captain America in a formal government review type situation. Yeah, basically. Well, because yeah, no, that's also something Sam says. He's like, look, man, give us the shield, turn yourself in. And, you know, he's like, they'll consider your record and it'll be OK. But, you you know, you can't be Cap anymore. And then he's like, <laughs> and he fights back against that, of course. And then that's what happens. Like you said, they're like, they do a review kind of thing. And I really do like that scene, how John kind of, ber- not berates them, but he tells them back. He's like, I did what you trained me to do. Like, I am a soldier, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and they're all like, well, this isn't a negotiation. And he's like, we're stripping you of everything already. And he's like, and it's like, he understands that. But he's also saying like, this is the world and this is the person I am. This is, you chose me (laughs) for this. Yeah. So I liked that scene as well. I think this show does a really good job of showing how like veterans get treated shittily. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Like um, without revealing too much personal information about you, you have somebody that was close to you that kind of went through something and didn't get the support when they came back, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it, yeah. it's gross when you think about it because it's like 
people are asked to like volunteer their safety and potentially their life to fight for a thing that is so like like the fighting and the the actual war is very like real but like the reasons behind it almost seem like kind of esoteric and strange mm-hmm. right like it's the government like fighting over little scraps of whatever yeah and like sam says at the end speech where he's just like who's in the room with you making those decisions he's like it's not going to be the people that you're affecting which is the sole totally. point yeah <laughs> yeah and, and and then they come back and then they're treated like they're completely disposable right it's yeah and of course that's really personified in isaiah bradley's storyline through this you know totally he was a vietnam vet and then he got 100 percent just you got imprisoned. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Okay. Anyway, Captain America is stripped of his title. He's now yeah. John John the Walker Man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we get a little scene with Barnes and Zemo, which is great. Barnes pretends to shoot him. Mm-hmm. And then the bodyguards. You know, you know what? Before that scene, don't we have a scene with Sam and... Uh, the random army man with Bradley. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure it's after it's after this because it, this happens like pretty early in the episode. Oh, but okay. I would say one thing I liked in that as well as when Zemo is talking with with Barnes and he says he's like, "Hey, I I'm not going to try to kill you because he, he basically like respects Bucky essentially, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and because that comes into play later on because basically Bucky was turned into a super soldier against his will mm-hmm. and. Zemo has explained many times how super soldiers shouldn't exist. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but so Zemo goes with the bodyguards, with the Wakandan people. Mm-hmm. And then there's a scene with Sam and what did you say his name was? Bradley, yeah. Bradley, where Sam gives the wings back and is explaining that he's just going to go home because there's nothing left for him to do there. Oh, so sorry. Sorry. Have- that's that's Torres, his his partner guy. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So that's earlier on, right? That scene? Yeah. Where he's basically like, um, I've been ordered to go home, and he's also going to keep the shield. Yeah. Yeah. And then he goes home, and he helps his sister. No, is that this point? What point do they have the boat party? So basically, he does go to Bradley after this almost immediately talks with him and bradley's like a black person shouldn't not shouldn't be captain america but he does say that because he's like you know the country kind of screws black people over all the time but sam's also like well but yeah because they basically have that idea where he's like but someone could take the mantle on and bradley's like but they're not going to accept a black person being a captain america that's right and then like you said then he goes and goes and uh hangs out with his sister to help try to get the boat fixed yeah, and they have a block party, boat fixing party. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Bucky comes to help. And he brings Sam a gift. He had some beautiful new wings commissioned by the Wakandans. Yeah, and a, and a new outfit. <laughs> and a new outfit. Oh, don't reveal too much, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then they have some some good back and forth between the two of them, some fun, and then some headier stuff the next day when they're kind of tossing the shield around, literally. <laughs> yeah, and then um, also Bucky flirts with Sam's sister. That's very important. Yeah, very. <laughs> um, also, they kind of, they they reconcile a little bit. Like, Bucky explains why he was upset that Sam didn't want to be Captain America. Sam explains why he felt like it was the best reason to give the shield back. Mm-hmm. And they reconcile a little bit. And then also Sam points out to Bucky, because he has his book of people he wronged, that when he makes amends, it's not about him feeling better. It's about the other person feeling better, which is a concept that I guess Bucky hadn't grasped up until that point. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And also, like, I like how because Bucky has Steve's notebook and the things that were written in there were about like Steve catching up and Bucky's notes are about him trying to like make up the things. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, like I said, there is some good character stuff, some good interaction there. 
and uh, really kind of gets at uh, some of the cruxes of the character. Yeah, and then Sam starts training with the shield. Yeah. Also, Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know she has a name, but I could never remember it. <laughs> it's Julie Louis Dreyfus. Yes, Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> or Julia, sorry. <laughs> Julia um, approaches John Walker and is like, I am the most awesome person in every room. Here is my card. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, we'll need you for something. Because she's like, I know you took the serum. Don't even worry about this. We'll get you. We'll get you something going. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll figure something out for you. Yeah. And is that all that happens in episode five? Did I miss something? Essentially. And then just at the end, we get the reveal that Carly and her crew are in New York and that there's going to be some kind of a vote. And uh, Batrock is there with some weapons and stuff like that because he's like, I want another shot at the Falcon. So he's like, I'll align with you. Because like, this is what you were saying with Carly going on the slope because everyone, every time she does something, she justifies her new step in that direction and this she's like what are you talking about you know we're working with criminals and she's like well we are criminals <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so then that's the the setup for episode six the final episode yes and so this whole episode i was wondering where's peter parker where's spider-man <laughs> this under his jurisdiction it and then be. i realized he's probably in far from home at this point sure <laughs> so he's in england Fighting Mephisto. Yeah. Right? That's who we fought in that movie. Mysterio. Mysterio. Oh, right? <laughs> Mephisto's Satan. The devil, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In episode six, a lot of stuff happens really fast, and then the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an hour long. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Carly and her crew set up an elaborate plan to block the vote. Yes, and also they want to take hostages. And they want to take hostages. Presumably to either negotiate a stop to the vote or just to, like, terrorize them. Yeah, whatever whatever they're feeling. Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. Sam figures this out because he's watching TV. Yeah, and he's like... I, I do like that. It's so funny because Torres is all like, well, there's a ping in New York. And then like simultaneously, it's like, there's this vote happening in New York. It's like, well, I wonder where there's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam calls Bucky and is like, we're going to do a thing. Also, Sharon, we need your help. Yeah. And so the three of them show up at the gig. Sam's in full Captain America Falcon outfit. Mm-hmm. It's Can I say quick? Oh, sorry. Cool. <laughs> yeah. As an aside, though, the only thing I don't like about his outfit, because it's a great outfit, is that the top of his head is exposed. Yeah, that's dumb. Yeah, it just seems like, especially considering that he flies a lot, that it's just like, like a bug hitting him would hurt. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> but it, I mean, that's a minor point compared to because the, the outfit is great. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a great outfit. But yeah, you're right. His head should be covered. Yeah. He, fight, he fights people that use gunfire. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so they fight things. Some of the hostages get driven away. Bucky follows. John shows up with Bucky and uh, helps them out a bit. And Bucky stops the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he rescues some people from a fire. Uh, there, There's... It's it's weird because in on my on my first rewatch or my first watch like uh, one of my notes is I was like oh I wish there was more like super soldier fighting in this because it's like yeah this is like John Walker and Bucky versus like four super soldiers mm -hmm. and I was like they, and on the second watch I was like okay there still is a good amount of it but it just feel like it didn't go as far as it could have gone with like a super soldier fight. That's fair. Yeah. Also, I forgot to mention at the end of episode five. John Walker goes crazy and makes his own Captain America shield. Yeah. <laughs> in his garage. <laughs> yeah. Which I love that in the fight, of course, yeah, the first time it comes up to them, it just gets immediately, like, bent. Because <laughs> it's like, yep. it's not vibranium, dude. <laughs> it's like tinfoil. <laughs> yeah. So I did like that aspect as well. But, yeah, it's a good fight, and I thought there were some good moments in there. And, again, we can kind of see some stuff where... 
uh, Carly does have her objectives and it just escalates immediately because she's they're like oh no they're here she's like okay burn that truck of that over there who cares because that'll distract Bucky and then she just tries to drive the other one off a cliff <laughs> essentially yeah there was like the, a good scene too where John has to decide between chasing Carly and saving the truck of people yes which I was going to highlight as well and and it's particularly interesting because he throws down his homemade shield to save the bus of people. Yeah. Which I thought was cool. It was like him making a good decision for once. Yeah, basically realizing that, you know, yeah, the objective can't be as important as saving lives. Right? Yeah. Totally. It was a good scene. That was a good mm-hmm. scene. No, I, I like that scene as well. And like I said, uh, I... Just re- wish that this fight was taken to another extreme, just because it's like we have these super soldiers fighting super soldiers. Uh, but overall, it was still a neat fight, some cool stuff. And, you know, like the, the guy rips out like a parking meter. And I was like, yeah, yeah I was going to say there is the parking <laughs> meter thing. That was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, because absolutely you would. You're like, I need something to just like, blam, rip this out and just start fighting with it. So <laughs> uh, like I said, there was some cool stuff in there. I just it could have been taken to another level, but what are you going to do? Because that wasn't the focus of the episode, surprisingly. After this fight ends, it goes on for another, like, half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the fight ends. They end up underground somewhere. And it's kind of a face-off between Sam and Carly. And he well, does a face-off. try to... I'm oh, sorry. What's that? I would say there was a face-off before that because Sharon gets to Carly first. Sharon gets to Carly, and she's like... Ooh, come back to work for me. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. And Carly's like, no, man, I'm a, I don't need you anymore. I'm a big shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the dialogue. <laughs> I know. I should write for Disney. Yeah. And and then Sam shows up and he's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to talk her out of it still. And she's like, no, I've. I've gone too far, ma'am. And yeah, it's... Oh, sorry. She's Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? No, I was going to say this fight's really interesting because, yeah, she's just now at this point just, like, lashing out. And he's still trying to talk her down. He's like, I'm not trying to fight you here. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and then she's going to shoot him, but then Carly shoots... Or no. Sharon. <laughs> Sharon shoots her, her instead. Yeah. He leaves... Because Sharon gets shot at one point, too. Yeah, in that standoff with Batrock, uh, Carly and Sharon. Sharon shoots Batrock. Carly shoots Sharon. Right. So Sam carries out Carly's dead body and leaves Sharon to bleed out underground. <laughs> <laughs> I and presume I, he did something, and then she's like, I, "I'll go hook up with Bucky. It'll be fine." <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> so. I did think that things got a little heavy handed at this point when he's like, he's got his wings out and he's carrying her like he's, he's an angel or something. And then he gives this is really good speech that I just felt went on for a little bit too long. Yeah. Peter's like, ah, fucking woke Disney just being woke. And I'm like, yeah, I get what you're saying. I also get that. Like if there were people who are watching this, who were like a little bit, like center right that maybe his speech might help them see kind of more of like the lefty perspective i guess yeah i mean i think like i think, but I I said it, think it went on too long yeah it, it's a great speech really great stuff and you know he's just some of the stuff like you said it could be cut a little bit or trimmed uh, but he's basically just talking about uh, you know seeing the other perspective and that was the whole point is that he, when they're like, well, you know, she was a terrorist and he's like, she wasn't a terrorist. She was just trying to help people like, you know, yeah, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I, again, it was really good, well-written. And like you said, there could have been maybe a little bit of a trim to it, but it was what the message they were trying to get across. Yeah. Then after that, what happens? So, the John Walker gets approached by Julia again, mm-hmm. and she gives him a new outfit, and now he's American agent. Is that right? Uh, U.S. agent. Yeah. U.S. agent, yeah. yeah. Which uh, is cool. 
What else happened? Uh, well, uh, I also really like this coda was, so they captured the other sol- uh, super, se- super soldier um, flag smashers and they get placed into a, you know, an armored vehicle that they're going to get transported to the raft and it gets blown up by Zemo's butler. Right. I almost forgot that because I forgot who Zemo's butler was. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because you only saw him like once or twice previously. And so this, like I said, calls back to what Zemo was saying earlier to Bucky, where he was like, I'm not going to kill you. So it's like he didn't make any arrangements for Bucky, but he made arrangements yeah. for these other people. <laughs> <Ha-ha>. <laughs> yeah. And then Sam has a party. And Bucky shows up and now they're best friends forever. <laughs> oh, yeah, their their friendship is more solidified and, you know, working as partners together. And as well as, of course, he goes to Isaiah Bradley and has, brings him to uh, Oh, yeah, he, he made him a museum. No, he made him a, a room in the museum. Yeah, in the Captain America exhibit. They got yeah. an Isaiah Bradley section now about him. Yeah, and he also brings Sharon back to the U.S. And gets her a full pardon. <laughs> full pardon and a job at the FBI. Or the CIA or S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever they say it is now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the intelligence agency. And yeah. then she goes on the phone and she's like, "Get you, start your engines. I've got all <laughs> the secrets now. And basically. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's the end of the show. Uh, essentially, yeah. And has a nice touch where it brings up at the end credits Captain America and the Winter Soldier. What? Like you know how the end uh, the end credits always said the Falcon and Winter Soldier, the season so Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Oh really? Oh okay, yeah. Yeah. Because no, that's all right. The only thing is that I think was funny about that is that Bucky is no longer the Winter Soldier. That's the whole point of his entire arc and existence. <laughs> oh yeah, he also apologizes to the old man that he was friends with. He says, yes. I killed your son. Yeah, basically you know, goes in and tells him the truth about how he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was just kind of like, because Bucky, you know, from White uh, you get White Wolf is what the Wakandans called him, and he calls himself that at one point as well, but everyone still calls him the Winter Soldier. <laughs> yeah, we should start calling him White Wolf. Mm-hmm. Or White Fang. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or Bucky. <laughs> White Fang. Just like yeah. the John Len- London books. Yeah. I say probably that's why they didn't do it, because it's it's in public domain or it's not in public domain. <laughs> Disney can't use it yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but they will. <laughs> yeah, but they will, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and just um, I, it was cool that they brought uh, George St. Pierre back to be Batroc. I liked that, even though they shot him again. I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> Who is he? Uh, he, <laughs> he was he, he's uh, the, the MMA guy that he fights in the first episode in the plane and then he fights with Carly. He's the criminal guy that uh, Sam fights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. Who was like, I want to kill the Falcon. That's uh, that's George St. Pierre. He was in The Winter Soldier. Oh, yeah. Uh, so he's like the same character and they brought him back. So I like that. I thought that was cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Any other moments you feel like highlighting throughout the show? No, it was good. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was very impressed by the, by it overall, especially on a, on a rewatch. Uh, I felt it like kind of flowed better and co- and coalesced better, better, better on a rewatch, especially the first time I didn't feel like episode six fully kind of like landed as well. But I, on the rewatch, I think it, it played a lot better. And uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it both times, and I have been maybe pleasantly I'll, surprised. Maybe I'll rewatch it while I'm waiting for Loki to come out because I am so excited for Loki. <laughs> yeah, and and I think, like I said in our WandaVision episode, where I was like, I was not kind of like keyed into this one, but again, pleasantly surprised by the the output. It was so good. <laughs> yeah, I I liked it more than I thought it would. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, I felt like number one, or episode one, wasn't the strongest at all in the series. So I felt a little disappointed after episode one, but 
once you get into like two, three, four, it's like peak awesome. Yeah, it really, it really ramps up and really gets, really gets going. And, and uh, yeah, the performances, the, the action, the, yeah, just all of it come, came together and really, really cool. It's interesting how this show and WandaVision exist in the same cinematic universe. Yeah. Because they're so different stylistically, but it all makes sense, right? Like it all kind of does come together. Sure. And there are like our world, many things happening at the same time and in all sorts of facets and stuff like that. So it all works. Yeah, it was cool uh, watching that uh, behind the scenes thing where uh, like because, of course, they do. There's tons of digital effects and stuff like that, but they did as much real wire work with Anthony Mackie as they could. Like uh, in episode one where he's on top of the plane, uh, Mm -hmm. they filmed him at an airstrip on top of a plane. (laughs) Right. Oh, nice. Uh, just like the planes on the ground not moving and but they like brought him in with wires and everything so then when they cg it all into the sky it looks you know that extra level of real and you know, if even, it was tom cruise they would have oh, yeah. shot him in the sky obviously <laughs> yeah, obviously they would have just would have strapped him on with the plane but uh but even things like it was funny they were talking about his outfit at the end that he in real life where he wears it it uh, crinkles and and moves especially near his neck. So they digitally have to remove all that and like seam, seam it onto his face, right? Oh no. <laughs> so, but it's like, again, they did a great work and great job with it because it's like, it doesn't seem wrong, right? That truck fight was interesting that highlighted because it's supposed to be in Germany and they couldn't shoot on a street in Atlanta that looked like Germany. So it's all digital. And there was some long shots that were done with people on trucks, like stunt people and on trucks and stuff like that and then that they could comp in but then the main truck action was done on fake truck tops that were four feet off the ground with just like (laughs) blue screen on the ground right and then so they could just digitally mat it all into germany (laughs) nice so yeah like i was saying earlier just like the ability to do that kind of stuff and make it look good is is there now right like i i never thought about for you know i was like okay but i was also like yeah (laughs) <laughs> like you buy it right no oh, totally so i was looking up a little bit of course uh there has been no official season two announcement or anything but there has been an announcement of captain america 4 and the head writer slash show creator of this uh, malcolm spellman is going to be working on that and oh, cool. there is rumor that they probably will keep the same woman as the director carrie scoglin but you know that's not 100 percent but so it's continuing on, and that's what's been kind of interesting. Like we talked a bit, I think, in WandaVision as well, that it's like these shows set up potential either movies or shows that they can just jump off with if they want to, right? Yeah. I'm, like, super excited and interesting, uh, interested about where they're going to go with the Loki show because both WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier did not follow what I thought it was going to be. Right. So I'm I'm very interested. I keep watching the trailer. I know you hate trailers, but I'm like, ee! <laughs> <laughs> well, and and like I've said a couple times, I didn't really have any information about this show going in, and blown away by the product uh, and the by the quality of it and the story. It was really good. Oh, totally. I'm just trying to look at my notes here. Your notes say it's so good. I wish they had kissed to the mum mum mum. I mean, I don't really write that kind of fan fiction, but I'm sure some do. <laughs> you can start. <laughs> the only thing that I think that it was not convoluted, but it was also kind of like, I guess, you know, supposedly playing, it's, it's the power broker stuff with Sharon, that it's like, what's totally her plan, right? Because <laughs> it's she's oh. like helping people that is negatively affecting her power broker outcomes, but I guess she's setting up so if she does work out, she'll be able to access more things to then be able to power broker better right (laughs) yeah i don't care at all what her plan is i just really enjoyed her in it (laughs) yeah that's fair it's interesting because i rewatched civil war which she Mm -hmm. was in she really just like when you rewatch civil war after watching this you're like she just really doesn't care about following the rules at all (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's fair like, I know she couldn't anticipate becoming the power broker or that, like, helping Steve would lead to that eventually. 
but at the same time, it just like when you rewatch it, you're like, man, she just she just does what she wants. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even uh, I think that starts along that journey. You could see that into Winter Soldier as well, which you've seen that movie, right? Yeah, I just yeah. haven't seen the first Captain America. Right. But even in that where it's like Steve is like already instilling in that value of like the system is broken. Let's just go against it. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, totally. Well, and according to one of the show uh, producers uh, when they were interviewing in that, basically that they've always wanted to include Sharon in other movies like Avengers uh, 3 and 4 and stuff like that they were saying but they were like there wouldn't be enough time to do something with her so they were like that would just be unfair essentially to the character because oh, they yeah. had so many other characters so that that's why they were like oh it's so cool that we could bring her into this and then have her do so much more yeah that's awesome yeah I, I don't know I thought she was cool in it mm-hmm. and I can't remember and so that was one of the things it basically it's like that's one of those things that they don't really talk about or mention uh, like it's like was was she snapped when it happened? I don't think we know. I I think that she wasn't. I also think she wasn't, but it's we don't know officially. Because I remember her bitching about stuff. She was bitching about no, not bitching, but like she was because Falcon brought up that like him and Steve were on the run for two years and she's like yeah so was i <laughs> yeah no but, but i was yeah. alone fuck you guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> i also i'm i'm inclined to believe she wasn't snapped out of existence because i think it would be really hard to rise to the position of power broker in six months yes agreed yeah so i think she's been alive the whole time that's fair that's always one thing that's been kind of, I think, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but it was always something that was interesting the way they approached it. Because in the original Infinity Saga, uh, Thanos makes sure to snap away Thor because he knows Thor could kill him because he's a god. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and in this, they didn't. Like in this continuity, they just, he, it was just pure random and he managed to survive, which broke Thor mentally and, phys- and spiritually. Great. But I was also like, he knew he could kill him. <laughs> How, what do you think about Thor gaining weight during the five years? Uh, I was fine with it. See, to me, it, it makes perfect sense. That that's, that's what I mean. It was like, he just gave up. <laughs> yeah, like he was like, even though he's like had highs and lows in his career as a god, m- most things come to him pretty easily. And this was, like, the first time that he did the thing and then the outcome was bad. And I'm like, yeah, I think somebody who felt, like, super powerful, as a god would, having things not work out for them in a very big way for the first time would would make you a little crazy. Yeah, he suffered a catastrophic failure that destroyed half the universe. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And he just shut down mentally. Yeah. I, I know it's not really related to the show, but like to the one we're talking about now, but I just, I don't know. I had, I had rewatched it recently and like we were talking about it and, and just mm. people, there's a lot of people who don't like that. That's how Thor interpreted his grief. Right. Well, no, that's exactly. Everyone's, everyone's would handle that differently and there's no way to know. Right. But that's one of my favorite parts about Endgame is like how, is about how each character processed what happened, right? Like, mm-hmm. Steve starts, like, an outreach group. Uh, Black Widow throws herself into her work. Yeah, tries to remake it right. Yeah, uh, Clint becomes an um, assassin samurai. <laughs> With a bad haircut. <laughs> With a bad haircut and gets the sleeve tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> And like Thor gets depression. <laughs> like I don't yeah. know. It makes the it makes the show more interesting to me. Well, and it, it also really helps. Uh, I think it also is really cool how WandaVision and this show, of course, then continue along that same continuum. Like they don't they don't ignore that that happened. Yeah, totally. It's like that's the main plot of this show is that, like that happened. <laughs> 
Yeah, one of my favorite things about the MCU is that big actions have big effects on people, and it it changes their character and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can I can see a world in like ten years or whatever kind of thing where they start like a newish continuity and etc. But it's like for the moment, all of these flowing into each other is quite excellent. Yeah, it's really good. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. I guess we should wrap up about the show because we've been talking for a while. Yeah, I was just trying to think if there was anything else we didn't really mention. Uh, The woman who played Carly, of course, her name is Erin Kellyman. Emily Van Camp as Sharon Carter, as we mentioned. It was kind of funny the... Uh, on that Marvel thing when they were interviewing Aaron Kellyman briefly, she was just kind of saying how she auditioned over like, you know, Skype and that kind of thing. And then she was like, when she was told she had it, she didn't really believe it. And she was like, it's, it's quite interesting. And how the flag smasher character was, um, I think his name was Carrie Morgenthau or anyway, or maybe Carl Morgenthau. So they gender swapped it. Right. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So and again, that's what I was saying, like in episode one, if people were familiar with because I had no idea that I've always said this, like I have no, no, very little of like MCU greater continuity. So all this is like, I don't care that they've gender swapped it or anything like that. So I have no preconceived notion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I, I liked that flip because they were like, oh, this guy's the leader because he was like tall guy with the with the money. But then it turned out, no, it was the little girl with the bag with the hair. <laughs> <laughs> good show. Good stuff. Good times. Highly recommend the watch. I agree. It's worth the six hours. Yeah. I was actually really surprised that it was only six episodes, but then I was also like, oh yeah, these are really long. They're like, they're like, they're like an hour a piece practically. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I think um, WandaVision was six episodes too, right? It was six or eight, but they were 24 minute episodes, right? Oh, right, right. Yeah. And um, Loki's going to be six episodes as well. Oh, is it? Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess, yeah, that'll be our MCU for now until eventually Loki. (laughs) Yay, June 11th. Can't get here close enough. (laughs) Or fast enough. (laughs) Um, I guess we'll wrap up then. Yeah, like I said, unless you have any final thoughts that you didn't get a chance to say. I don't have any thoughts whatsoever, Dad. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If you liked this episode, please rate and review us (laughs) or just Um, share it (laughs) share it send it to your friends and family you can follow us on instagram tome of uselessness we have a website tome of uselessness.com you can email us with your suggestions tome of uselessness at gmail.com and that's it i hope you have a wonderful life (laughs) stay safe and thanks for listening Bye.